All righty, all righty. Yeah, praise the Lord. Boy, I've seen God make a way when there was no way, right? Yeah, everybody said, boy, there's no way. Well, God makes a way when there was no way. And I believe God's gonna do it again and is doing it and in the process of doing it. And we praise the Lord for the way he works, right? <laughs> he just does great thing. And I know, Melissa, you were encouraged to see Robert and Wesley right there, yeah. Yeah, that's good to have you two boys there, yeah. Praise the Lord. Anyway, glory to God. We have been um, dealing with, since for the probably last three or four weeks, talking about greatness, talking about how to be great and, and great people and, and, and people that are made great in the Lord because God created us to be great. God never created any of us to be mediocre or to be a failure in life. God created us for greatness because greatness with God just simply means uh, leaving God's mark on others. Now, to be great with God, it means that you've been created for a purpose. It means that, that God wants to work through you to make a mark on this world and on the people around you. And so in order to be great, it doesn't mean you have to have a lot of money. Now, I know that's what the world calls great. The world basically says if you have a lot of money or if you're very popular or if you're powerful, then you know, you're great. But that's not God's definition of greatness. His definition is that if you would leave his mark on others, and you might say, well, pastor, how in the world would I ever do that? Well, you could begin with the fruit of the Spirit. It would be really a wonderful place to start, wouldn't it? Right? The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 says uh, uh, that it is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. So any, you, you could just choose, choose any of that fruit right there and, uh, and be that to the world and show that to the world, live that to the world, distribute that to the world, and you'll, I'll guarantee you, you'll leave your mark to be a loving person, a joyful person, a good person, a gentle person, you know, a kind person. Oh, my goodness. And self-control and, and faith, to be a person of faith, that would certainly leave a mark on the world. But anyway... King David has been our character that we've been looking uh, at uh, in this series, and uh, I've chosen to use him to show 10 marks of greatness. There are things that happened in King David's life. King David certainly left his mark on this world. He had some tremendous assets. He's still considered the greatest king that Israel ever had. And so as a king, and in kingly duties, and in the duties of the court, boy, he was fantastic. He also was a tremendous soldier. David didn't lose battles. He was a champion and he was a great fighter and a great leader and a, and a great hero with all of the works that he did on the battlefield. But even though he had tremendous assets, he had some very uh, powerful weaknesses in his life. David was uh, seemingly pitiful when it came to relationships whether they be relationships with his own children or with his wives, and he had eight of them. That ought to show you something to start with. And he had pitiful relationships. Uh, and he also had some, some, some very deep uh, issues with uh, parenting skills, shall we say. As a matter of fact, I'm not really sure David had very many parenting skills, if, if any. But... God used him and God made a mark and God said he was a man after his own heart. And we've been looking at, okay, what would make David a man after God's own heart? What would make David great? What is it that God used in the life of, of, of a king that had on one hand such, such, such powerful weaknesses and yet on the other hand was used greatly by God to, to be the king of a nation and he's still after 2,000 years, he's still considered the great, well, actually closer to 3,000 years, he's still considered the greatest king that Israel ever had. So we've been looking at the 10 and, and the, first, the first one, both of the first two came from the battlefield. Field. So these are uh, two of the great truths of being a great person. And the first one was that if you're going to be a great person, you're going to become great on the battlefield. And I'm not going to re-preach that, but it just means that uh, we become great in action. Uh, you don't become great sitting at, at the house eating pig skins on the couch. No, you, you become great by being out in the battle that the Lord has called you to. And then the second great uh, attribute that comes off the battlefield is that great people take responsibility for their failures. 
We don't blame somebody else. You don't, you don't point the finger somewhere else. It's me, it's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And not only do I accept responsibility for my failures, I use those failures to help me grow forward in life. Look, the fact is we're all gonna fail sometimes, right? We're human beings, we're sinners. That's why we need a savior. And so there are gonna be times in our life where things happen that are unexpected and we're tempted and there are all kinds of issues that can go on that can cause failure in our life. But great people grow from their failures. They admit it, they, grow, they take responsibility and they grow from their failures. The third one today is, is one that we come off of the battlefield and we, we come home with David. And the third uh, great truth about being a great person is every great person must rise above the pain of their past to reach their God-given destiny. Now this is a big issue. This is a big, this is a, this is a big truth here. And that is that all of us have pain. We all have hurt. We've suffered in life. A great person has to be able to move past that pain in order to pursue what God has destined their life to be. In other words, if you're stopped by your pain or stopped by your hurt, then you're not gonna ever accomplish what God puts you on this earth to accomplish. King David is the greatest king of Israel, but if you've ever read the book of 1 Chronicles, I mean, excuse me, 1 Samuel, uh, really kind of beginning around, around uh, chapter 13 or so, and 2 Samuel, and maybe just a little tiny bit of 1 Kings and 1 Chronicles, just a small bit, uh, you'll be surprised, I think, to see how miserable David was as a father. To begin with, as I mentioned uh, to start, he had eight wives. I mean, that, he had eight wives that are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, there may have been others, but these are the ones that are named for us in the Bible. He had many concubines. He had many affairs. Uh, the most famous, of course, obviously, was Bathsheba, and we've looked at that. Uh, many biblical historians believe that David had as many as 51 children. Uh, imagine that, and, and, and so anyway, uh, you, you get the idea about David and about, about his family. This was a very uh, dicey situation, and because David uh, was messed up and didn't know how to deal with love and relationships and, and children and family, and all, because he was messed up, his children were messed up too. Uh, his firstborn child was Amnon, Amnon was a lot like David in many ways, and he was obsessed. He became obsessed with his half-sister Tamar. She was a beautiful young lady, a virgin, the Bible says, and he just, he, he just became obsessed with her, and he uh, became interested in her sexually, and, 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 he, and he ran some kind of scam, and he got her to his, his place, and, and then uh, tricked her into coming into the bedroom, and, there, and he raped her. Well, then he threw her out of the house and told his servants to bolt the door shut. And Tamar was on the street and she had a coat of many colors and she ripped the sleeves and she put ashes on her head and she ran to her brother Absalom's house, who was her full brother, and her, he took her in and began to take care of her and mend her and help her, uh, mend her back to health. But the point being that Amnon rapes Tamar, that's uh, the oldest boy and, and the daughter, the only, the only daughter that's named in the Bible, and then Absalom, who is her real brother, of course, uh, uh, is offended and hurt and, and feels like David Daddy's going to do something about this. I mean, this is not going to go unpunished and so forth. Well, for two years, David did absolutely nothing. And after two years of stewing and sputtering and being angry about this and believing dad's going to do something and dad did nothing about this, Absalom takes matters into his own hands and Absalom kills Amnon. And when he kills Amnon, he flees to Gesher, which is a place that is... Uh, his maternal grandfather is the king of Gesher and he stays there for three years. Now to just get this in mind, we're five years into this thing. There's been five years since Amnon raped Tamar. And in the five years that, that, that have transpired since that time, what has David done? David hadn't sent out, sent out to, get Am, Am, uh, to get Absalom and ask him, what, why did you do this? What, is, what did you do? Uh, 
He hadn't even had a family meeting. He, he, he hadn't even talked to his children about uh, this tragedy and all these things that are going on in his family. David did nothing but sit there on the throne silently and watch his family disintegrate. Well, after five years, David had a tremendous general. His name was Joab. As a matter of fact, Joab was not only a general for David, Joab was almost like a hit man, really. Anything that that might hinder David in any way, Joab took care of. He was a tremendous general and uh, a great confidant and a great friend of, of David. Well, he saw that this was a tragic situation, that it had been three years since Absalom went to Gesher, and David hadn't even sent a messenger he has he hadn't talked to his son he hadn't even he hadn't sent for him or anything and so Joab says this is ridiculous and Joab um, contrives a plot to get Absalom to come back and and the plot works and Absalom come comes back to Jerusalem where David is but David still won't talk to him David, David won't say a word to him. As a matter of fact, not only would David not talk to him, David wouldn't even meet with him face to face. David, I mean, he didn't send a message to him. He didn't do anything. Well, after two more years of this, now we're seven years, seven years since the rape of Tamar, uh, five years since, the, since Absalom killed Amnon, and still David hadn't even spoken to Absalom or, or any of his family about this. And so Absalom begins to get obviously frustrated by this. And he, and, he, and he goes to Joab, the great general, and he says, why did you even bring me back? If, if, if daddy's not gonna talk to me and we're not gonna get this thing settled, why, he, won't even, he won't even meet with me or look at me in my eyes or talk to me at all. Why did you even bring me back? And Joab leaves without you know, an answer and and so Absalom, brooding and stirring and being angry about this, takes matters into his own hands. His field is near Joab's field. Joab has barley planted in his field. The crops are up, and Absalom says, well, if I'm gonna get your attention one way or another, and if I can't get it in a good way, I'll get it in a bad way, and he sends his servants down there, and he burns down Joab's barley field. Well, Joab comes out there. I don't know why Joab didn't kill him right there on the spot. That would have been Joab's nature. But, but somehow he restrained himself and he, what you burned down my fields? Because daddy won't see me. And so Joab arranges a meeting finally, after seven years now, he arranges a meeting between his daddy and his really fourth son, Absalom. And, uh, but they don't talk. All that happens in the meeting is David, uh, uh, David is there on the throne when he comes in. Absalom comes in the room. David kisses him, you know, like one of those little Eastern things, you know, that kind of little deal. He doesn't talk to him, doesn't say anything to him, doesn't have anything to do with him. He just kind of kisses him, and that's the end of it. Too much water under the bridge, huh? I mean, you know, uh, they've gone too far. Uh, uh, Absalom's too angry about this, and, and so... Absalom is a very, uh, a very attractive, charismatic young man. As a matter of fact, uh, his pride is his hair. He has long, beautiful hair. Every year he cuts it, and there's an auction in Jerusalem for who might buy and purchase Absalom's hair. I mean, it, it, he's just a beautiful young man and a very charismatic young man and now a very angry young man. And he begins to spread the word in, in the city of Jerusalem about the fact that his father's not the king that he ought to be. And he starts an uprising against David in the city of Jerusalem. He, Absalom goes to, uh, to the city of Hebron and, and, and gets made king there at Hebron. And then, and now uh, he comes back to Jerusalem and David, the king, actually has to flee for his life. David is on the run, fleeing for his life because his own son is trying to take the kingdom away from him. Kind of, may, I mean, kind of makes you feel better about your family right now, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, yeah, you're looking around and say, hey, my family's not so bad. Yeah, well, well why was David such a bad father? How many of you uh, would understand that you can't give away what you don't have? Yeah. Right? I mean, if I want to give something away, the first requirement is that I must have it. Well, in order for David to be able to be a real father, 
and to give his children love and, 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 uh, and to handle things with his children and to rear his family and to train them and teach them and be a model and all of those things. He, he, he would have to have that on, on the inside of him. But look at what the Bible says about, about David in his life. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm gonna read about three verses here. Just look, this, this is just an example of David and his father. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. So God had not chosen any of those boys to be king. Samuel said, God did not tug at my heart and say, any of these seven boys that I've looked at, which were the seven brothers of David, David was the little eighth son, the little baby boy, he was the youngest boy. And all seven brothers passed before Samuel, and Samuel said, none, the, none of these, all of the, uh, none of these has God chosen. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and he brought him. Now he was ruddy which just simply means that he was light-complected with reddish hair. Probably had some freckles. You guys know Ruddy. He was ruddy with bright eyes and good-looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So this is an interaction a big interaction between David and his father. And the only thing that I, I want you to see there is, it just, it's an example of how his father uh, treated David. Uh, uh, David obviously doesn't get any attention from Jesse. Uh, he certainly doesn't get any favor from his father. I mean, how would you like to be the youngest son and it's a big announcement that the prophet is coming to your house and the prophet comes to your house and everybody is included in the things that happen there except you. So you're not invited. You're out in the field keeping the sheep. All the other brothers are there. And according to what the scripture says here, uh, when Samuel asked, are there any more? Jesse said, yeah, there are. And uh, I got a young son and there he is as if to say, I mean, look, he's right there as if you could see him from, from the house. So if you could see him, that means he could see you, right? Now imagine you're the youngest boy and you're watching a prophet come in and all the big family hoopla and celebration and you see your dad go up and take your oldest brother and, and, and try to sell him to the, to the prophet as the one. This is the boy, this is my oldest boy. He's so smart, he's so strong, he's so big, courageous. Surely it's him. And Samuel said, no, no. And he brings the second one up and he brags about him and he tries to sell him. Well, surely this one must be the one. And then he brings the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh boy up there and he just brags and he, and he, and he speaks favor over them and he respects them and he gives them honor and, 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 and he gets to the seventh and Samuel said, it's not any of these. And Jesse just stands there. I mean, Samuel had to ask, do you have any more? Jesse didn't say, oh, well, oh my goodness, you know what? I forgot about my, my youngest boy is right, there he is right out there. Eliab, go down there and keep those sheep. Tell David to come up here. Boy, you're going to love David. He is, boy, he is so beautiful. He's a smart little kid. No, 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 no. Jesse didn't even think about David. He, he wasn't even on his mind. So here's a dad that has no favor, speaks no, nothing positive, adds nothing positive into the life of King David. Well, you know, lots of time, if you don't have a father that is a good role model for you uh, and loves you and speaks favor into your life, uh, maybe you have an older brother that will do that for you. Sometimes older brothers can kind of take the place of an absentee father and so forth. Well, when, the, when Israel went into battle, all of David's brothers went into the battle and, and they were fighting against the Philistines. And 
One day, Jesse uh, gave uh, David a couple of packs of nabs and said, go up there to the battlefield and uh, take these snacks and, 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 and give them to your brothers and see how the war is going, see how, you, how, how your brothers are. And so David takes off to the battlefield and David arrives at the battlefield just about the time uh, Goliath is making his daily uh, pronouncement of... Uh, uh, against Israel and against God. And he's blaspheming God and he's calling them cowards and he's down on the battlefield and he's challenging everybody. Just about that time, David walks up and David's listening to him blather on and shout and insult and disrespect God. And when he finishes his little diatribe, David looks at one of the soldiers there and says, uh, who is this big mouth uncircumcised Philistine? that he'd speak these vile things against the armies of God. And the soldier said, Have you, do you know what's going to be done for the guy that, that takes care of that big guy down there? And David said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, the king is going to give him so much gold he can't even carry it, and he's going to get to marry his oldest daughter. Oh, it's going to be wonderful. And then David, you know, asked again. David said, what did you say? And when he said, what did you say? His older brother Eliab overheard the conversation. And it just flew all over Eliab. And Eliab comes over there and he says to David, I know why you're here. I know your wicked heart. I know how cocky and arrogant you are. Who told you to come up here with your meddling self? And what about those little raggedy sheep you have down there? Who's taking care of them? And he just lamb blasts David. He just ridicules him and mocks him and, and, and just powerfully dismisses him and disrespects him. And then, of course, the next man in David's life was his boss man, King Saul. When David defeated the giant, David went to work for King Saul to play for him when that evil spirit bothered him. Well, that worked fine for, for a, a few days, but the women of the town began to sing a little anthem about David is slain, uh, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has slain his tens of thousands, and the, and the green-eyed monster of jealousy flew all over Saul, and Saul got all in a fit of rage and a fit of jealousy and started throwing javelins at David trying to kill him. So what I'm just saying to you is that, that David was rejected by every male role model in his life. Every powerful male in David's life didn't show him anything about how to love his family, how to train his children, how to have, how to have a relationship with younger people. They, they, they showed him nothing in life. So... Is that why David was such a bad father? Because he didn't have anybody to teach him? You know, uh, our children, and when we're children, uh, we're, we're born, and, and I'm, for lack of a better way to put it, we're born with a, like a little, little, little video unit inside of us. And you know, as we grow up, what we do is we video everything that happens in life. Like how our dad treats our mom, how our dad talks to us, how our family gets together and talks things out, how, how the issues of life get handled. Uh, what does this family believe in? Uh, what are the morals of this family? Uh, what kind of prejudice do we... I mean, we're, we're, we're filming everything, right? So that when we get our own families, we go back and we play these videos in our mind and, and, and we treat our family much like, uh, like we were trained to treat our family. Now, I don't think David had any of these videos. Because David never had a dad that did anything with a mom or him or any, and he never had an older brother. He never, he had never, he, had, he never had any male role model as far as the scripture shows that taught him anything about relationships and family and love and all of those kind of things. And, and, and is that what made him a bad father? Could we look at David and say, well, you know, he, he really never had a chance because he wasn't trained. Well, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think he, we can say that, not, not really, because what happened to David gives us a perspective about what was going on on the inside of David, but it really is not an excuse for not being a great father. Because you have pain, that, exclu that excuses you from being a great father. Because you have pain, it means that you have every right to inflict pain on your children who will inflict pain on their children. And I mean, I mean that, that, that's going to be permission to live a life like that. 
No, I don't think so. Because all of us have had pain, right? I remember asking when we were together, it must be what, Tanya, six or seven weeks ago now. I asked, I was preaching on the hurt locker, the first message. And I asked the question to the whole congregation and you guys that were here will remember it. I asked, how many of you have had something happen in your life that you would consider devastating? You, you were hurt by it. It was, it was terrible. And you would consider it devastating in your life. And almost everybody here raised your hand. And raised it quickly. You know why? Because when you're devastated, you know that you're devastated. So we've all suffered pain. Some of us, and, 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 and there on your screen are, are some just very common pains that people suffer. These that you're seeing there are, are just uh, normal kind of things that lots of people suffer from. Rejection by a father, mother, or your siblings. Rejection by a husband or wife. You've been abandoned. Your parents have divorced and it, 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 it was devastating to you. Or maybe you've been divorced and it just, it, it just turned your world upside down. The death of your parents, especially if it was premature, that's a terrible thing. Or maybe some of your family or somebody that you loved. Adultery. Maybe somebody's committed adultery on you. Maybe you've committed adultery. And it's a terrible uh, bruise, hurt, abuse, social rejection, failure. You failed in school. You failed to make the team. You didn't make it in athletics. You failed in business. You failed in finances. Um, you have physical problems or handicaps. or long, I mean, and on and on and on you could go. I mean, all of us have had pain and hurt, Right? Now remember, we're talking about greatness here, and what is this truth about greatness? This truth is that every great person rises above the pain of their past yeah. to, to, to move to God's, to your, to your God-given destiny in life. And I'm sure that all of this lack contributed to David's failure, but the problem that made David a bad father was not that he didn't have skills placed in his life by those before him. What made David a bad father is that he had pain in his life that he wouldn't deal with. He wouldn't face it. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't see it. He didn't recognize it. He didn't, he didn't deal with it in life. He... He pretended it wasn't there. David had all kinds of advisors. David was the king of Israel. David had Zadok, the, uh, the priest. He had Ahimelech, the priest. He had Nathan, the prophet, who was his pastor. Surely in his kingdom, he had lots of fathers that, have, that had families and had good families, and he could have talked or brought any of them in and said, hey, man, I need just a little advice. I know you have a good family. Can you help me a little bit here? Uh, you know, he had all kinds of... Joab, the general, even recognized, we need to go get Absalom. This is a terrible thing. He's been gone five years. You had not even talked to him. I mean, David basically sat on his throne and did nothing while his family literally became a, a reality show. And I can hear some of you saying, well, pastor, you know, I've had some people in my life that were like David, you know, those strong, silent types, you know. That used to be almost a, a heroic type of statement. Oh, he's just one of those big, strong, tyrant, big, strong silent types. No, may I say to you, and I'm, I'm going to say this as kindly as possible because I'm really not trying to insult anybody, but there are no big, strong, silent types. There are only weak, silent types. Strong people talk it out. It's just like functional families. You know one of the signs of a completely dysfunctional family? Family that don't talk to each other. Family that, that won't make eye contact. I have actually pastored families before that the only way the family knew that someone in the family was mad at them is because they wouldn't make eye contact with them. And they knew it was over when they finally would make eye contact with them. That's dysfunctional. 
strong people, strong families talk things out. So, so, so David became, David was a bad father because David had pain that David wouldn't deal with. You know how David tried to deal with his pain? There are three non-curing ways to deal with pain in your life. And I'm just going to hit them real quick, real quick. Medic first one is medicate yourself to numb it. This is, when, this is the way David tried to, to, to uh, get rid of his pain. Da David, David medicated himself. Uh, Amnon also was, was a self-medicator. Uh, you know, David's, David's drug of choice, of course, was sex. Uh, um, and uh, that's, that's one of the things that people use. And people use alcohol, and people use drugs, they use gambling, they use shopping, they leave overeating. I mean, there are lots of things that you can become addicted to. And, it, and, and because you're a medicator, it doesn't mean you're going to get, uh, 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 you're, you're not going to be, uh, uh, abuse every substance. But what you are going to be is a compulsory person uh, with a propensity to be addicted to something else. As a matter of fact, obsessive compulsive behavior is often tied to, uh, to hurt in life and pain in life. So David tried to medicate his pain. You can't, you can't, to medicate your pain just means you try to make it go away for just even a moment. I mean, whatever it is, let's just get rid of this pain. I mean, it may only be for a moment, but that moment is worth it to somebody that's medicating. There's a second way that people try to deal with pain, and that is to motivate yourself to forget it. These are the overworkers and the, and the workaholics. These are the obsessive people, the compulsive people, people that can't stop, people that can't, that can't sit down and, and be quiet. I mean, people that even in their Bible study, they can't really just sit there and be alone with God. They have to be doing something. They put on some praise, which is no, it's no problem to praise the Lord while you study your Bible. But uh, if you're putting on the, the, the music so that it'll be noise so that you can't hear what God's saying to you and you're trying to avoid dealing with issues in your life because you know if you ever get quiet that, that those issues are gonna start kind of coming up in the back of your mind or the Holy Spirit is going to bring them up into the back of your mind and they're painful and you don't wanna deal with that. You don't wanna deal with the emotions of that and the pain of that. So what do you do? You just keep yourself busy so you won't have to deal with it. They're not going away. The third way that people try to, uh, try to get rid of their pain is they meditate to deny it. Dwell on your pain and rehearse your mistreatment over and over and over in your memory. You're gonna be the victim. Somebody always did something wrong and you, 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 you don't talk about it, you ruminate. You, in other words, uh, you bring it back up, you regurgitate it back up and chew on it some more. Yeah, yeah, like a cow chewing a cud but you're not a cow. God didn't create you to be a cow. And the more a chow, cow chews on his could, the more refined it gets, uh, and, and, and his stomach is able to digest it. You, on the other hand, the more you chew on it, the bigger it gets, and the bigger problem it gets to be in life. So, this is what Absalom did. He just brooded over Amnon. Surely David's going to do something. David's got to do something, doesn't he? He's got to arrest somebody. Somebody needs to go to jail. This is not fair. This is unjust. And, and, and until finally, he so angered himself by just over, over brooding on this thing that he finally took matters into his own, to his own hands and he killed his own brother. Ephesians 4 says this to us about this thing of anger. I, I, I wanna share this with you just real quick. In Ephesians 4, here's the scripture, you, you probably know it by heart. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. This passage is just basically saying when we're angry, don't sin by holding on to your anger. Don't sin by nursing a grudge. Get over it quickly before the sun goes down. That's just God's way of saying, look, don't let this thing linger in your life. Because when it lingers in your life, it's going to create sin in you. And you're going to give a mighty foothold to the devil. The word devil there is the word diablos. Diablos means slanderer, accuser. 
So what this is saying is, if you go to bed angry, whoever you're angry at, the devil is going to spend all night accusing and slandering them against you, and you're going to wake up in the morning more angry than you went to bed. They're going to, the devil is going to accuse them and, 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 and raise everything that was done to the highest level possible. I mean, you've seen it, guys, right? You hadn't made the mistake of going to bed angry at your wife, right, or your husband. And you turn your back and you lay over and you won't even breathe hardly because you don't want to give them the satisfaction of knowing that you're alive. And then, and all night long, you know what's happening? You're being counseled by the devil. That's what's happening. Diablos is whispering in your ear about how mistreated you are and why they did this and why they did that. Look, deal with it quickly, God says. Don't, don't, don't brood over it. Don't, don't ruminate over it because the devil will get a mighty foothold in your life. Well, what can we do about all of this? If we, I mean, we can't medicate. That's not going to take our pain away. We can't uh, motivate and work ourselves to death. That's not going to take our way, uh, pain away. We can't meditate. We can't just rule it over and brood over it and make it go away. What can we do? Well, I could preach a whole sermon, and I know you guys are aware of that, on the, <laughs> on the greatest example of a person who handles their past in the right way. And of course, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul and in Philippians chapter three, you know all the passages about forgetting that which is behind and pressing toward the mark and, and, and moving forward in life. And I could preach a whole sermon on that, but let me just sum it up for you real quick in about three little quick things here. Number one, what can you do about it? All right, you have pain in your past, right? I know you do. Yeah, somebody mistreated you. Uh, they hurt you. It was devastating. So what do you do about it? Number one, you go to God and you talk. Yeah, uh, and what else? Uh, well, that's it. You, you go to God and you talk. In the Bible, in Hebrews chapter four, what does it tell us? It says, uh, it says seeing then that you have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, that has passed into the heavens, let us hold fast our confession that we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin." Therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What does that say? That says come to God and talk to God about whatever hurt you. Look, you don't need to be a preacher. You don't need to be a, a spokesman. You're not, you're not practicing the Gettysburg Address. You're going, God... My father mistreated me or my mother left me or so-and-so abandoned me or that divorce was terrible or whatever it might be that hurts you so deeply that it's caused a wound inside of you that is holding you back from going where God wants you to go. Listen, let me tell you a secret. You're not going anywhere until you deal with that thing because that thing is holding you back. So tell God. He's not surprised. He watched it happen. He saw it. He knows all about it. Tell him, God, I need you and obtain grace and mercy before it's too late is what that's talking about. God, I feel dirty and grimy. God, my bones feel like they're breaking. God, I, uh, I can't quit thinking about it. It's horrible. Uh, and, and, and you go to God and you talk to God. And then number two, you let God talk and you listen. Yeah. God's going to speak to you. There are many books written on boundaries. Maybe you've read some of them. I don't think God's read any book written on boundaries because God doesn't respect boundaries. Uh, you know what boundaries do? Boundaries mark what you're responsible for. That's what a boundary is. It, it marks an area that you are responsible for. And boundaries are fine unless you use a boundary as a fence to keep God out of certain areas of your life or anybody else that might try to help. 
You know what God's going to do? God's going to listen to what you say, and then the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth, is going to speak to you about the issues of your life. Now, I don't know how he might speak. It might be a message that I preach and you're here at church and God says, God just bears that in on your heart and that's the answer for you. Or it might be a verse that you read in the Bible and God just highlights it and it means more than it's ever meant to you and you see things you never saw. It might be a Christian friend. It might be your mama or your, heaven forsake, forbid, your mother-in-law. I mean, it might... It, God's going to speak to you. The Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. It might be that still, small voice that's on side, on the inside that we call a conscience. But before you can go to the future, God's got to help you deal with the past in your life, and God's not going to stay in the boundaries. And the devil makes you ashamed because that shame keeps you in the darkness where, where, where the devil is the prince of darkness and keeps you away from being cleansed and healed by God. And then here's the third thing. You forgive, you repent, and you receive forgiveness. Listen, there is nothing that, that takes the place of forgiveness in this healing scenario. You cannot heal if you can't forgive. The Bible tells us to forgive. The Bible says, you forgive others as I have forgiven you. You're not perfect either. You do bad stuff. You made mistakes, and so do other people. Forgive them. You choose to forgive them. Well, Pastor, I can't forget about what they did. Well, I'm not saying you have to forget. As a matter of fact, do any of us have the ability to erase something out of our brain? No, we don't. So God says, in spite of the fact that you can remember, you choose to forgive. It's vital in this thing. I saw a little, a little quote the other day. I, I have a little quote I say about unforgiveness, and it is this. Unforgiveness is an acid that does more to the, to the container in which it's stored than the victim on which it's poured. This statement says... Uh, Unforgiveness is like drinking poison yourself and expecting someone else to die. That's how terrible it is. And then you come clean before God. What does God say? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take this to God. Talk to God. Listen to God. Do what God says. All right. Let's bow. 